So that should end the discussion right then and there because uh, the council members are elected according to the city charter to legislate. That's what they do. And the voting in favor of the sewage treatment replacement plan, like it or not, is a legislative act and a political act. Because that's an invalid basis, it doesn't matter what they say about the asbestos. The asbestos portion, portion of the petition is somewhat confusing, but essentially they're saying you let something happen and you didn't challenge it. Uh, and that assumes that the council members have a duty to administer. And that's not their duty. Their duty is to legislate. The city manager is to administer. The charter of Mark Wild is also a memorandum makes that very clear. Um, my, we appreciate you taking the time to come here and give us the time to do this. You've read the memorandum. There's an awful lot of material. Uh, but I want to boil it down to that very simple point. Um, and our, our memorandum goes through an analysis of, of the, the various there's seven statutory grounds for recalling uh, a council member in this particular instance, and these, uh, uh, this defendant has alleged, uh, I believe he's just categorized as misfeasance, malfeasance, nonfeasance, and then this vote on the sewage treatment plan. Our memorandum goes through the analysis of why those things, the, the allegations in the petition, don't fit the statutory grounds. Another important point to uh, make is that we can't just make conclusory allegations have to allege facts. You have to say things uh, that are substantive from a factual standpoint. It also recites that the, the, uh, <coughs> the, the recall committee believes it's a wrongful act. It can't be based on a personal belief. It has to be uh, a statement of fact. The, uh, have, the allegations have to be more than a belief. They have to have some relationship to what the council members are doing. Many of the cases that are cited where recalls are upheld are easy to understand because the petition says council member Smith stole money from the city of Apopka. That's an illegal act, in fact. And that's one of the things that's prohibited by the statute. Uh, in fact, Mr. O'Neill uh, was counsel for a recall committee in one of the cases that's in our memorandum, it's in his as well, the Thompson case. And there, the council or the, the, the recall committee alleged an illegal act on the part of whoever they're trying to recall, the Orange County Commissioner, uh, violation of the Sunshine Law, meaning outside of the Sunshine. That's an illegal act. And that recall petition was allowed to proceed because that's what they alleged, and that's one of the illegal acts to support uh, in the uh, statute. We, the other cases you know, deal with recall Many of the cases analyzed in various petitions deal with things where people are dissatisfied or disgruntled, and the courts have adopted various standards for analyzing those things. Applying those standards here, even if you uh, uh, believe that voting in favor of a sewage treatment replacement plan was a valid basis for a recall, uh, if you apply the uh, case law to the allegations of this petition, it still must fail. Um, Can that uh, 
allegation of allowing a hazardous and unlawful handling to go unchallenged. This would fit one of those two uh, statutory grounds, malfeasance and misfeasance. Malfeasance and misfeasance both require an, an act. You have to do something. Here they allege that they didn't do something. They were supposed to do something. Nonfeasance, neglect of your duty, requires that you have a duty. And again, as I pointed out earlier, these gentlemen are legislators, not administrators. And that's expressed in the city in the city charter. And what they're being accused of is not doing the city manager's job, perhaps. Um, I think it's a red herring. It doesn't really belong there. Um, it doesn't fit any of the statutory elements. Therefore, it can't be the ground for a recall. We've analyzed those, uh, those words, uh, and the cases are cited in our memorandum, Your Honor. Um, the, uh, the last uh, statutory thing I wanted to point out statute was incompetence. That, that, do these allegations that are recited in this petition equate incompetence? And uh, in the Coleman case we cited, and again this case didn't involve a recall, but it was talking about an elected sheriff, and they define uh, incompetence as a physical, moral, or intellectual quality, <coughs> the lack of which incapacitates one to perform the duties of his office. Uh, the court went on to explain that incompetency may arise from gross ignorance of official duties or gross carelessness in the district. So we have, again, ignoring the Garvey case, looking at this allegation of letting something go unchallenged, does it rise to the level of gross ignorance or gross carelessness in the discharge of the duties? And that ties us back into the duty argument as well. Not these gentlemen's job to deal with that administrative issue. Uh, and we don't believe it can uh, rise to the level of incompetency. Finally, Your Honor, and I've gone through the analysis of the petition, um, we get to the entitlement to injunctive relief, which is why we're here. And we have a, a high burden. Uh, of course, we're aware of that. We have to prove that we have. That, that an adequate legal remedy is unavailable. Gentlemen were elected by the citizens of, of Marco Island. They, they, <coughs> they, they legally, I don't believe the court could fashion a legal remedy that would uh, entitle them to remain as members of the Marco Island City Council, uh, but by an injunction. They, we believe that the analysis I've just set forth with respect to the face of the petition demonstrates that we have a substantial likelihood of success on the merits. We believe that irreparable injury will occur uh, if the injunction is not granted. If they're recalled, they can't be city council members. No amount of money or uh, anything will undo that process. And that's the irreparable injury. Fairly simple. And finally, the granting of the injunction will not harm the public interest. And there I'm simply suggesting that a majority of the citizens elected these gentlemen to serve as council members. The legislative electoral processes should be allowed to run their course, and an injunction would not uh, harm the public interest, it would actually preserve and protect the public interest. There would be some sense of stability with respect to the electoral processes involved. Uh, based on that, Your Honor, that's, that's simply our position. We think that if you read the first allegation, uh, on August 21, 2006, Councilman Trotter, Minozzi, and Tucker voted to extend the STRP to three new districts. That right there, on its face, throws up, means this petition is invalid because that's what they're supposed to do. Uh, I'm not going to vote for George Bush the next time he comes up if he, if he ran again, but I did. And if, I, if he was running again, I'd vote him out of office. But I can't recall him. It's not being impeached. These gentlemen can't be impeached or recalled on this basis. The last thing I want to mention, Your Honor, is I incorporated in my motion, uh, a motion under 1.270 to consolidate the trial of the merits of this case with this hearing, with this injunction application, because uh, as the arguments of the case have, it's a very simple process, uh, and I believe Mr. O'Neill would agree with me, we're talking about the facial validity of this, this petition and nothing else. So there isn't any other evidence to submit. Um, I think it's simply a matter of law for the court to decide the sufficiency of the petition. Therefore, this should be the beginning and the end of the entire proceeding. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr.
Neil makes a point that the uh, process that hasn't run, at least the initial process, and you said that it's about halfway through the second stage, and that this is inappropriate to be addressed at this point and should be allowed because obviously it, uh, using up all your administrative rights, so to say, is foundation of the law so you don't tie up the courts making needless decisions would not be more appropriate to wait and see if they got the 15 percent I believe is the number we're looking for uh, then okay. right I understand the question Robert and I, I noted that in Mr. O'Neill's memorandum um, <clears throat> what I want to essentially the issue is not right because it hasn't been determined that they will face a recall very short time frame involved with once the petitions are certified. Uh, if the gentlemen don't resign within a number of days, the <coughs> chief judge has to schedule the election. Uh, the, the court could enter that injunction uh, sometime later, as opposed to today or this week or this month, uh, to give my clients the relief they need. Uh, I would submit that if it goes that far, there's going to be a tremendous expense that will be incurred uh, by the public. To the election or to <coughs> well, the first day, second I, day? I, I honestly don't. The election, obviously, you know, that would be an expensive proposition. <coughs> I do not know what kind of expenses would be incurred by the supervisor of elections or the city of Marco Island if they had to start preparing for an election. I don't know that, and I'm not prepared for it. I won't say anything one way or the other. I would point out, Your Honor, that, that I noted that in addition to um, the answer says that, that injunctive relief is appropriate, that declaratory relief is appropriate. Those, those jurisdictional obligations. The cases that are cited in the memorandum, I've looked at them, and one of them is in my memorandum, it's in Mr. O'Neill's uh, memorandum too, the Bennett versus Valentine case. The injunction actually was filed at the same time before the election was scheduled. It's at uh, my tab 10, Your Honor. Um, the action was filed while the second petition was being circulated, which is the petition we're dealing with here. There, the court proceeded to uh, grant injunctive relief. Um, and I would also point out, Your Honor, to try to answer your question uh, more fully, is there are cases in our memorandum there in this room deals as well that say injunctive relief is the only relief that's appropriate in the situation. It's what the council members have to have. Those cases didn't discuss when the case was filed. The only one I read that said when the case was filed was the Bennett case. I don't think that would be a financial consequence. Uh, the, the process in and of itself uh, subjects them to this process that they shouldn't have to undergo. Mr. Anya, it was a very fair knowledge speaking. I just wanted to comment on one thing. So that's fine. Yeah. Uh, one of the first things that uh, Mr. Menzies brings up in his memorandum is that the uh, motion for temporary injunction is the appropriate vehicle that we should be here. So I'm, and I read the statute and there is no <coughs> statutory provision for uh, interrupting the process. And so this is more or less like a motion to dismiss um, in, in the process. Would you agree with me? Yeah, and to translate it over into the judicial process. Okay. Okay. Yeah, uh, as far as, I guess, sorry for the last point moving forward. Uh, we have kind of a dilemma here, uh, just as Mr. Menzies and his client want to reach the substantive issues that Mr. Menzies has raised today. We want to also reach the substantive issues today. Um, uh, I wish I could take credit for the rightness argument, but it's not my argument. I had a uh, similar hearing with uh, Judge Goldstein over Fort Lauderdale a couple of months ago, and both the attorneys again wanted to reach the issue today. And Judge Goldstein said, well, have either of you thought about rightness? Is this right? And it, it was the same point of the process. It was in the midst of the second round. And of course, we, we both you know, told the judge that we had thoroughly researched the issue, even though none of us or neither of us had thought about it before. But uh, and he ended up holding that it was right and uh, did not make a ruling. And they did not reach the 15% or whatever that's worth. Uh, the cases, uh, the counsel has cited about the injunction, the Ben case was, I think where they interrupted the process was, uh, it says, 
following a hearing, the circuit court entered a temporary injunction restraining the supervisor of elections from verifying the counterpart signatures. Uh, another one of the cases, the Tedder case, the injunction was actually entered against the city clerk to prevent the city clerk from going before the commission to uh, schedule the, the recall election. So I don't think there's any case that interrupts the process in the midst of the second round. <coughs> but again, our dilemma, you know, for what our purposes, we we deeply appreciate if the court finds appropriate to reach the substantive issues that Mr. Menzies has raised in this motion. And I suppose, especially if the court agreed with their argument that the wording was improper and the thing you'd rather not find out now. Absolutely. Why, why waste time and, and time to have that kind of uh, As to the substantive issues, uh, I think uh, just in retrospect, having read the two memoranda, where I think Mr. Menzies and I disagree on the state of the law the most. Uh, the first one is, uh, as I understand the argument, uh, Mr. Menzies is saying that a vote per se, a vote per se, cannot constitute good legal grounds for recall. Um, and I think I've uh, cited a bunch of case law to the court. Uh, and one of them I want to point out is the Hines versus Dozer case. And uh, in that particular case, it's a, uh, a third DCA case, but a very well reasoned third DCA case. And uh, the, uh, uh, there were six particular grounds that were asserted in the recall petition. And the third DCA, uh, this was before the, the Galvin case, uh, decided that if any ground was bad, then it all goes down. They, they found that five of them were good grounds. And the five that were good grounds, I just, I'll just briefly read excerpts from them. The five good grounds, uh, number one, on or about March 9, 1961, the said commissioners authorized the payment in excess of $4,000. On two, on or about April 3, 1961, said commissioners refused to support a motion and second made by the remaining commissioners to cancel the contract. Number three, said commissioners refused to take action against the interstate engineering company. Number four, on or about June 9, 1960, said commissioners adopted an ordinance authorizing a contract with interstate engineering. Number five, on May 12, 1960, said commissioners attempted by emergency ordinance to ratify an agreement. Um, in this case, the Hines case, uh, I think I pointed out in my memory, is cited uh, in a couple second DCA cases. It's not disapproved, it's just distinguished. Uh, they say that the, the Hines case dealt with uh, possibly unlawful activity. And the Hines case, uh, the, the possibly unlawful activity was these votes uh, to take certain actions that the actions were unlawful, not the vote per se was unlawful. In and of itself, it means nothing. But we think that the Heinz case stands for the proposition that a vote can constitute a good ground for uh, instituting a recall. The second legal issue that I think we have a disagreement with Mr. Menzies, and I didn't necessarily hear it this morning, but just reading the memorandum, uh, well, he has a general complaint that the uh, petition lacks specificity. Um, I think that the, the deeds that these commissioners did, that's specific. Um, uh, Mr. Tucker, for example, voted for an extension of the SDRP to three districts. Uh, and Mr. Tucker allowed this uh, concrete, this asbestos hazard to continue. So I think that the factual deeds are specifically stated. But what is at stake is uh, what makes it unlawful for him to have done those things. Um, and I know he cited in a left handed compliment of a petition that I had drafted. Thompson case and said it's, it cites the Sunshine Law and therefore this is the model and therefore this is what it should have been done here. Well, yes, it does cite the Sunshine Law, but there's no case law. Well, the statute, you've read the statute. There's nothing in the statute that says that the statement of grounds has to cite the specific statute or law that the petition is asserting was violated. Um, and there's nothing in any case law construing the statute that says the petition has to contain the petition a particular statute or law that was violated. Um, and one of the practical problems with that is uh, the petition is a, is a political document. It's not a judicial document. You're not submitting it to a court or to other lawyers. You're submitting it to voters. So if there had been citations to law, the voters may or may not have understood what those were. And then once you start down those roads, uh, you say, well, you have to cite the statute. Well, then you cite the statute. Since you're dealing with lay people, should you also not be required?
required to give some sort of a lay explanation of the statute. And you go down and down that road, and there's a 200 limitation, 200 word limitation. And the problem is there are also a bunch of other things that have to be stuck within those 200 words. So you have a real problem every time you say specificity, specificity, where you, you on the other side, constrain somebody to 200 words. You're, you're sort of limiting what specificity can be in there. As far as uh, I think uh, Mr. Menzies used the, the phrase politically charged, and I think in, in my uh, uh, memorandum, I think I said politically unpopular. We both agree that you can't recall the uh, city commissioner, city council, just because he enters a vote that is politically unpopular. You have to, uh, additionally, the action has to also violate some law. Um, in, in these two situations, one with the SQRP, the statute, there's a specific reference to, uh, let me see, disproportionate share costs and uh, pay to pay over 42 miles, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's a specific statute, the court might be aware, it's in chapter 170. It's 1702, I've got a copy here, I'll give it to the court if you want to take a look at it. But it basically says that uh, special assessments against property deemed to be benefited by local improvements as provided for in section 1701 shall be assessed upon the property specially benefited by the improvement in proportion to the benefits to be derived therefrom. Uh, by saying the disproportionate share here, even though the statute is inside it, you are saying, in fact, something that is prohibited by that particular statute. <coughs> Additionally, um, one of the other aspects of that uh, paragraph is that there was no need for the septic tanks got some case law for us to take a look at it. The government requires you to do something where there's no benefit actually achieved by it, like taking a street two miles of the air or something like that, and you're required to pay for it. Well, that's confiscatory. That's not actually the due process. So taking your money through taxes or special assessment without any countervailing uh, public purpose, legitimate public purpose being served. Uh, the second part, the uh, in, in council was correct, the, 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 uh, the the statement uh, Council Trotter allowed a hazardous and unlawful handling of asbestos to be on a challenge, resulting in months of possible asbestos exposure to people on Marlboro. Again, the statute is incited there, but when you're dealing with environmental uh, hazards, there, there are specific affirmative duties in the law, both state law and federal law, regarding uh, how you deal with hazardous substances. Um, I've got, uh, I can give you the sites, the uh, Clean Air Act specifically defines, this is uh, 42 United States Code 7413 sub 4, specific, specifically says negligently releasing into the ambient air a hazardous air pollutant listed in 7412, it's a, it's a crime, it's a one year in jail crime, and in 7412, Asbestos is specifically stated as a quote unquote hazardous air pollutant. In the, uh, the circle of less legislation, uh, which is 42 USC 9601, uh, again, there's an affirmative duty where you have a hazardous substance, and I give you the case size, but I think it's a matter of common knowledge that asbestos is a defined hazardous substance under the uh, circle of all the federal environmental laws. And that if you are operating a facility which is defined as any site or area where a hazardous sus substance has been deposited, stored, disposed of, or placed, or come to be located, then you have this affirmative duty to clean up that the federal government has, comes in and cleans it up, you're responsible for the cost. And that the duty doesn't just run to the entity. Uh, you may be aware of case law in the past where the, the federal government isn't precluded by just going after the corporate shell. But federal government can say, okay, well, who are the owners of this corporation? Who operates this corporation? Who are the officers? Who are the directors? And the standard is, do they have the authority and control to have prevented this from occurring? Some of the case law says, did they exercise that authority? Did they exercise that control? Brought with me a case law out of my room dealing with, uh, it's called Simpkins versus Marriott Limited, dealing with a hotel site next to the Miami airport where the Marriott Corporation had to clean up some hazardous ways, and they sued not only uh, the owner of a cardboard uh, processing plant, but also the president of the corporation. And the uh, it's out of the Southern District of Florida, the, the case law says that if the president of the corporation had the authority to have prevented this and did not do that, then 
He's a defined operator. He's liable, et cetera, et cetera. And in this situation, what we're doing, this is one of those rare situations where there's an affirmative duty in the law. When you're dealing with a hazardous substance, a situation like this, that there are certain people who have affirmative duties. And uh, one of the people, I believe, is the councilman, the different councilmen in the city of Mark Alliance. They have the authority and the ability to control this particular hazardous situation. Uh, Your Honor, we brought with us today, and I don't know how much you want to get into it because we only have an hour, but we have sort of layers, since this is an evidentiary hearing, we have layers of background to this particular situation uh, with regard to not only the septic tank replacement program, but also the hazardous waste. We've got pictures, we've got charts, we've got graphs, we've got video. And I don't know how much you want to go into that, uh, whatever the court's discretion is, but uh, to give you a background, unless you already have a background, I think it's common knowledge and common mechanics and what you want So, whatever the court prefers as far as the evidentiary presentation. It, unless uh, you want me to make an evidentiary presentation. evidentiary aspect. Your Honor, obviously we would object to that because we, we, we think that the court has analyzed the petition on its face. Uh, I'm not aware of what other evidence this might be. Uh, as an example of, of the problem with that would be uh, Mr. O'Neill was just speaking about suggesting that these individual council members have an affirmative duty to uh, do something about asbestos if there's some asbestos there. Uh, I would agree that that's the law uh, inside of the charter. I would submit that that would be the affirmative duty of the city of Marco Island. The city didn't do its job. The citizens could take up the cause against the city of Marco Island. There's four other council members uh, that allowed this to go on channel. I don't know why they're not here. But one, one of them, may, maybe someone couldn't be recalled because it's too close to the, to the time they were elected. But this is an act of the council as a whole. So I would object to that kind of presentation in its entirety um, because the plaintiff believes that the defendant believes these things happen. But again, there's no affirmative duty, and that's the issue as a matter of law. Uh, they would be going to try to prove what happened, but it doesn't answer the question the court has to answer, which is uh, assuming this asbestos allegation can stand, it has to be based on an affirmative duty. And as we said in our case, uh, in our memorandum, for example, in the Moultrie case, the committee alleged the city council failed to investigate whether the chief of police was black. They failed to investigate whether the chief of police was black. Insufficient. No duty in the charter there. Here, council members are being recalled is because they failed to allow something to go unchallenged. Same thing. So the, the, the duty question that preempts all that. Your uh, couple points, Mr. Menzies. Uh, One, the legal duty uh, is just duty or the duties that are imposed by the city charter. Uh, as an example, he's complimented me with the Tom Thompson's case. Uh, that has to do with the Sunshine Law. That wasn't the city charter law that was violated. Uh, the, the case law construing um, 100.361 says it has to be an unlawful activity related to the performance of their duty. It doesn't say that it has to be a violation, simply a violation or only a violation of the city charter. Um, so we think that by saying unlawful activity does bring in state law with constitutional state And I think it also brings in the state constitutional provisions, which due process would be involved, uh, as well as federal constitutional and federal law provisions. Uh, secondly, part of our evidentiary uh, presentation would be uh, we have uh, excerpts of council meetings where this is affirmatively brought to the attention of these particular gentlemen uh, that this is going on. Why don't you do something to stop this? And, uh, the failure, uh, it, it was not stopped. Um, so uh, I think that would hone down why it is uh, that we think that these people, as opposed to the city in general, have a duty once this has been permanently brought to their attention and they don't do anything about it, that, that we do think the law has been violated. Is there, whether it's federal or state or local law, something that the asbestos aspect that requires uh, the city council to go forward or, or something. I know you argued about the Marriott and the board of directors and, and all that, but there, 
the only thing I can do is make an analogy. The, the, uh, again, the, the case law, the American environmental law, says you don't have to stop at the corporate shell. You go behind it and find the people that are in authority and control. And I guess the analogy uh, would be to the third round in the Heinz case that said commissioners refused to take action against the interstate engineering company. Uh, in, you know, here they, we, we say it, and we personalize it, that uh, uh, they allowed it. We don't say they refused to take action, we say they allowed it, but I think it's came out to the same thing. Uh, that I think if, if Heinz was good, I think this is good. And uh, finally, Your Honor, I don't want to bore the court, but uh, in the uh, 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 preliminary considerations and the memorandum, there, there really is, we are here on a temporary motion, motion, but we do want you to reach the merits. Uh, uh, there really is a high burden to get a temporary injunction in terms of substantial likelihood of success, clear legal right, in, in particular recall actions. You have to show that what is being done is clear.
I'm going to go back and reread it. First of all, the court accepts the, uh, uh, through agreement, the conversion of the motion for temporary injunction uh, or petition into a motion for judgment on pleadings. And we'll uh, rule accordingly. And in light of that, I want to go back and go through, in particular, some of the cases you emphasized this morning. 